Hello, my name is Bill Whalen. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution and the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. It's my great privilege to introduce you to Neil Ferguson, the Hoover Institution's Milbank Family Senior Fellow. In addition to his insightful commentary on world affairs, Neil Ferguson is also a distinguished author and historian. In fact, he is the chair of the Hoover Institution's History Working Group. In that capacity, he's drafted a working paper that we're going to discuss today. But first, Neil, I want you to talk a bit about the history uh, group and what exactly it does. Uh, I think this is actually a tremendous thing you've done. It's very much in keeping in the tradition of what Mr. Hoover had in mind when he formed our institution, which was not only to study war, revolution, and peace, but also to bring scholars together to learn about the past, to better understand the present, and better anticipate the future. And indeed, to, to study revolutions, uh, war and peace. And uh, that's why the Hoover Institution sits right next to a large archive full of materials that are relevant to those subjects. The Hoover History um, Working Group is a, a, a new thing uh, that, that only came into existence a matter of months ago. Uh, but it's sort of complementary to the Hoover Military History Working Group that my good friend Victor Davis Hansen set up some time ago. And it seems to me that uh, there really ought to be a kind of uh, civilian uh, history enterprise uh, to complement it. We also, I think, uh, in setting it up, had in mind a kind of policy-focused kind of history. Uh, mm -hmm. I've even been known to use the term applied history. So. Uh, we tried to uh, steer our seminars towards what might be called policy relevant history. And we've had uh, some excellent seminars uh, since we got up and running on uh, financial issues, for example, a terrific paper by Mike Bordeaux on, on globalization and historical perspective. But then along came COVID-19 and uh, our seminars in the Hoover buildings had to be uh, suspended. And like so much else uh, in the world, we had to, to zoom it. And, uh, and we thought that given the circumstances, the smart thing would be to focus on what we can learn from the past about, about pandemics. And that's what this paper I've written is about. Let's talk about the paper, Neil. The title is Black Swans, Dragon Kings, and Grey Rhinos, The World War of 1914 to 1918, and the Pandemic of 2020 to question mark. That question mark is very ominous, my friend. Uh, and I want you to explain what a black swan, a dragon king, and a gray rhino is. But first, let's talk about the premise of the paper and what inspired you to connect the problems of the present to the problems of over a century ago? Well, the easy option uh, for a historian confronted with a pandemic is just to look at other pandemics. And uh, there actually have been a rash of papers, for example, looking at the 1918-19 influenza. The problem is it's very difficult to disentangle the 1918-19 influenza pandemic from World War I because it started before the war was over. And there really isn't an easy way to separate out the impacts. And in any case, I try to argue in the paper that, that we shouldn't be too siloed in our thinking, that, that a really big disaster uh, can take multiple forms. Uh, and there are special kinds of disaster that we historians find very interesting that, that have distinct properties that make them quite hard to predict and hard to anticipate and indeed hard to understand uh, as they're, they're happening. And in, in this broad category of very big and hard to predict disasters are wars, uh, financial crises, uh, earthquakes uh, and pandemics, all of which are governed by a curious statistical thing called a power law, which just means that they're not normally distributed like, say, human height or IQ. There's no bell curve for wars. There's no bell curve for pandemics. When you look at the samples, the kind of list of these events in history, it's very striking that there are some absolutely huge ones that just stand out a mile. And then lots and lots of really quite small ones. And so they aren't normally distributed. So what I wanted to suggest was that if you think of that broad set of really big unpredictable disasters, actually a pandemic like the one we're going through might have more in common with the outbreak of World War I than with, say, the Black Death of the 1340s. That was the organizing idea of the paper. Right, and the commonalities, Neil, are that first of all, there are plenty of warning signs that this was going to happen. Uh, secondly, that when it did happen, the public was shocked that it happened when in fact they should have been braced for it. And then thirdly, just tremendous upheaval, economic, social, geopolitical. 
And that brings us to my strange menagerie in the title, which, uh, which I'd really better unpack. Uh, so the, the, the way you just introduced the concepts is, is quite nice, actually, because a grey rhino is something you see coming. You've got lots yes. of warning that it's coming towards you. And, uh, and so you really ought not to be surprised. And, and both World right. War I and the COVID-19 pandemic were like that. I lost count of the number of people over the last 20 years who said we should really be worried about a big pandemic. And I really lost count mm -hmm. of the number of books written before 1914 that, that said at some point Britain and Germany would probably go to war. And yet, Perfect. despite this gray rhino trundling towards us, when the event actually arrives, we are shocked, stunned, astonished. This was completely unexpected. And, and, and that's the moment at which it becomes a black swan. Uh, a black swan is a term Nassim Taleb popularized. And it, it just means something that somehow you just didn't see coming at all uh, because uh, your expectations, maybe because of the way our brains have evolved, maybe because of the way we're educated, your expectations are that everything is really normally distributed. Like your chance of having a car accident is just like your chance of having a world war or a pandemic. So despite the gray rhino, it, it, when it actually happens, it's a black swan and we're totally and utterly amazed. And then finally, right. uh, the Dragon King. So the Dragon King is something of such colossal size in its historical impact that it's sort of out with even the power law. It's beyond the power law. And I think when you look at a, an event like World War I, its historical impact is not really just because something like 10 million men lost their lives prematurely on battlefields. It's all the consequences that followed from the war that make it such a huge historical turning point, uh, to, to name just one, the Bolshevik Revolution. And I might right. add that probably the Spanish influenza was one of those other second order consequences of the war that had actually bigger impact than the war itself. It killed more people than the war, oddly enough, right. that pandemic. And I don't think it would have happened without the very strange circumstances uh, of 1918, uh, after four years of slaughter with armies crisscrossing the world. Uh, in a way, the world had been set up for disaster. People were weakened, exhausted, in many cases hungry, uh, and the trenches of uh, of the battlefields and the army camps were actually the perfect place for a new influenza virus to take shape. So that's the way I think about this. An event can be simultaneously a gray rhino, utterly predictable, repeatedly predicted, and a black swan, totally and utterly amazing and surprising, and a dragon king, massive in its ramifications. Right now, you took this paper in one direction, Neil. That a lot of World War One documentaries do not. You talked about you talked about economic disruption, in particular, the effect on globalization. One doesn't normally associate globalization with the first early decades of the twentieth century. Yeah, globalization is not uh, an invention of the late twentieth century. Uh, in fact, the real first stage of globalization was uh, the late nineteenth century and early twentieth century, when. Every market for goods, for labor, for money, even for ideas became much more integrated than it had ever been before, partly because of technology. You know, steamships just became super efficient. It was suddenly very easy right. to cross the Atlantic or even the Pacific. And then the telegraph allowed communications to happen far more rapidly than had been possible before. So I don't think I'm saying anything controversial. In fact, it's really quite an, a familiar story now to historians when I say that the First World War ended the first age of globalization and ended it very abruptly. Mm -hmm. You also talk about the rise of socialism. Socialism today, Neo, democratic socialism, strikes me as sort of salon socialism. It's very popular if you're elite, if you have a very you know extravagant lifestyle, if you're a career politician. What was the difference between socialism today versus socialism back in, in the World War I area? Were there the likes of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn's? Well, there were Sanders and Corbyn-like uh, figures back then, but they were a good deal more doctrinaire, that is to say, much more committed to the teachings of Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, right. and later Marxist theorists like Karl Kautsky. So I think if one goes back to the pre-1914 pre period, uh, social democracy was really socialist, and it was committed to a, a broad range of, of policies that implied substantial diminution of the rights of private property and, and the imposition of considerable state controls over the economy. 
I don't think many of those uh, socialist leaders in 1914 quite appreciated what was happening when the war broke out. It caught most of them unawares. Uh, but it turned out to be a fantastic opportunity for the most extreme Marxists, who were the, the Russian Bolsheviks, uh, to make their revolution. And that, of course, uh, was a real moment of truth, because when the Bolsheviks seized uh, power in October 1917 uh, in the Russian Empire, they proceeded to implement the most radical version uh, of, of Marxism uh, that, uh, that really has ever been, uh, embarking on wholesale massacre of, uh, of the capitalist class, followed somewhat later by the massacre of the so-called kulaks, the big peasants, which was Stalin's brainchild. So, yeah, by the standards of, of, uh, of that time, today's uh, self-styled democratic socialists are, are pretty weak beer. Let's talk about the ruling classes, Neil. Um, it's hard to find a more, you know, quizzical group of characters than the likes of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump in this age. But if we go back 106 years, Neil, you have Kaiser Wilhelm and George V, their first cousins. Uh, George and Nicholas are first cousins as well. Wilhelm and Nicholas are third cousins. Why could not these three blood relatives figure out a, a situ figure out a way to get out of this war? How could how could they not stop the train from going down the tracks? Yeah, the House of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha was uh, an extraordinary family that had somehow managed to get uh, various uh, relatives on to almost every throne in Europe. But uh, it turned out not to be enough to, to prevent conflict, any more than it was possible for the Rothschilds, who had the world's first truly multinational bank uh, in most of the European capitals. Uh, no, in the end, the decision makers uh, turned out to be prime ministers, chancellors, generals, in particular the chiefs of general staffs, and, and, and the Kaiser and, uh, and his relatives ultimately had to yield to the political and military advice, which was that uh, you actually had to go for it in 1914, because any later military confrontation would only be less advantageous. More or less everybody kind of formed that view, and, uh, and that was why ultimately all the great powers decided on, on war. But I think you, you make an important point, which is that uh, it, it was a rather remarkable descent into conflict, considering how closely related all the royal houses of the great European empires were. It was just another reason why people were so taken aback by the very rapid way in which uh, Europe went from an assassination in a little Ruritanian town called Sarajevo to the biggest war there had ever been. I think, I think you've captured one of the reasons that people were surprised. And mm -hmm. final question, Neil, um, is this just a common thread that we see in the human existence where we devote a lot of our intellect and imagination to worst case scenarios? There was a movie in 2016 called Pandemic. If you go on the TED Talk website, Neil, you'll find 61 different talks devoted to pandemic. Yet, when push comes to shove and you the, when the event strikes, we're just, we're gobsmacked. We don't know what to do. Is this something we see throughout history or is this unique to now and unique to 1914, 1918? Well, I think part of the point of doing a paper like this is to is to make the, the contrasts obvious as well as the similarities. If you take another really big disaster like World War II, that was anything but a surprise when it began. Indeed, many people thought it would begin in 1938, and it nearly did. But there's a very big contrast to be drawn there uh, between something that uh, is a black swan or at least appears to be when it happens and something that that stays a gray rhino all the way uh, until you're uh, you're actually marching towards the front line so I, I think not all disasters have the quality that 1914 and 2020 had and I, I think we need to address a, a particular question which there wasn't time to do in the paper and that is why some of these big disasters are effectively anticipated and others are not. I don't think it was inevitable that we would be so completely gobsmacked by a pandemic because not every country in the world was. 
uh, right. there were countries like Taiwan and South Korea that knew exactly what to do almost the minute they heard a rumor about something funny going on in Wuhan. So I don't think it's always the case that the gray rhinos turn into black swans at the moment of truth. I think sometimes actually we successfully anticipate disaster. And what makes history fascinating mm -hmm. is that we now have to ask that next question. Okay, why are some of these gray rhino, black swan, dragon kings so much more disruptive uh, than others? Why do we sometimes get it right and sometimes get it wrong? And that, I think, ultimately becomes a question of, of political history. It requires us to analyze why government departments that were notionally responsible for biodefense so utterly mm -hmm. failed uh, in the last four months, because ultimately that's the kind of question historians are going to be asking, if not this year, then maybe in a couple of years' time when we've got enough bandwidth to have a proper commission of inquiry. Neil Ferguson, thank you for your time and uh, congratulations on the History Working Group. It is a smashing success. And on behalf of my colleagues, just keep doing the great work you do. Thanks, Bill. I am Bill Whalen, a Hoover Institution Research Fellow and the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. And you've been listening to Neil Ferguson, the Hoover Institution's Milbank Family Senior Fellow and the Chair of the Hoover Institution's History Working Group. <laughs>